Hi, this is Paul, and I'm having uh, my second conversation with Ron Dart. And you can go back in my channel and find my previous talk with Ron. Ron, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit so that folks know who you are? Okay, I live up in uh, British Columbia on the West Coast. I teach at the uh, University of the Fraser Valley. It's one of our bigger, bigger middle-sized universities in Canada. It's about 16,000 students. We have about 1,400 faculty and staff. I teach in the area of political science, uh, philosophy, and religious studies, and so the old humanities in that sense. And so it covers quite a span in terms of classical thought, in terms of the Western intellectual, political, religious, theological, philosophical, artistic tradition, and then I also teach Eastern traditions as well. I did my um, master's degree and PhD in terms of Western intellectual thought and Eastern intellectual or Oriental thought. And then a, a third level was biblical studies. And so I've taught here for 30 years. Before that, I was Pacific Director of Amnesty International. And then I was head of the Middle East for Amnesty International within Canada for a while also. Okay. Okay. Now, you're, you've told me that you're editing a book about Jordan Peterson. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, as you, as you were, certainly since 2016, Peterson's been catapulted onto the front stage of, um, of public life, and there's been a variety of reactions, some uh, very much dismissing, demonizing, caricaturing him, others it's genuflecting, hagiography is the you know, best thing since motherhood and apple pie, and <laughs> Um, and so between these two reactions, this book is, it, it's three aspects to it. One is, is asking the question, why has he become so prominent on the public stage? What's the, the gap that he is filling in that a lot of people are not speaking into uh, and, and doing it in a way that's obviously creating diverse reactions? The second part of the book will be to ask, what is the good he's contributing to the public discussion? And then what may be critical questions to ask of, of, of Peterton? What may be some of his blind spots, his Achilles heels? And so we're, we're trying to find a middle way between hagiography and demonization and saying he's, uh, that there, he's obviously contributing something. He's speaking into a vacuum that a lot of people have been timid about. They've been hesitant about saying things because they know they're going to get reactions. Uh, and then what is the good he's contributing? Uh, and what maybe some of them, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of his limitations, blind spots, overreacting in certain situations. But so it's hopefully it's, it's a gracious but critical reflection. And we've got about 15 contributors. They'll be covering a wide range of, of uh, what's the core of Peterson and then what are the many spokes that come out from that core that sort of make the wheel of his life go round. And uh, so anything from biblical studies to myth to symbol to the you know, postmodern neo-Marxism to his interest in religion and his uh, Obviously, his work in clinical psychology, his work in Carl Jung and other uh, psychologists as well. And so we've tried to, he's a bit of a Renaissance thinker. Uh, he, he, he dips uh, and dabbles in some areas. In other areas, obviously, there's a greater level of research and understanding. But there's a breadth to his thinking. Um, and so we're, we're trying to just explore that uh, a little further uh, in the book. So the articles are coming in. We hope to have the book out probably by the summer of this year. Okay, okay. Well, so what do you think is, well, first of all, what first caught your, how did he first catch your attention? What caught your eye about what he was doing? Well, I think primarily being a teacher inevitably have students in their late teens, early 20s, mid late 20s. And many of them were uh, quite attracted to his, um, he hadn't published really anything until 12 Rules for um, Life came in. Back of that, of course, was his Maps of Meaning, but most hadn't read that. That was a 1990s book. So it was more his coming on the public stage and raising questions, on the one hand, about perhaps the fragmentary nature of postmodern thought and, and, and in terms of how do people navigate, orient when there, there are no markings on the path or they're always being deconstructed. The other hand, the other hand of liberalism, so one is that you can't say anything substantive, everything is perspective. The other is almost the politically correct element of, of liberalism. These are the issues you have to line up, and, and if you dare to differ, uh, you're almost, uh, you must be living in caves most of your life or in the Catskills and you're a hillbilly. And so there's, the, there's this sense that 
this is what you're supposed to stand for. And if you differ, then, you know, the, there's obviously problems in terms of what's going on between the ears. Uh, so he challenges both those two agendas. And then the response often to that is some form of reactionary conservatism, which is equally problematic. So students get caught between those three pathways, intellectual pathways, and they're not satisfied with any of them mm -hmm. in that sense. And they're looking for an alternate way um, that one hand is willing to interrogate the model. Either fragmented, perhaps simplistic, and on certain issues of the liberal wing, but also they don't want to be reactionary conservatives um, either. So they find in Peterson a nimble, somewhat of a nimble thinker that can't be easily cornered, pigeonholed, or what Shakespeare would say, cabin cribbed and confined. And so I would say the initial, the initial introduction was um, students coming, wanting to do their papers, class presentations, wanting to do guidance studies on Jordan Peterson. That's very interesting. So now you, what, what interested me too is our last conversation, we talked about Erasmus and Luther. You, you've also written a book on Erasmus. Can you give just a little thumbnail introduction to who Erasmus was and why he's important? Yeah, Erasmus was probably one of the, if not the most significant thinker of the uh, Reformation period of the early 16th century. And um, he constantly tried to walk this middle way. I mean, he was very critical, like Luther, as Calvin would have been later, of course, of the aberrations in the Roman Catholic Church. And Erasmus was raising the criticisms of the church long before Luther came along. He was part of what's called the Oxford Reformers of John Collett, Thomas More, and Erasmus was part of that group. So he was, he was probably one of the most significant pioneers in terms of uh, critiquing the Roman Catholic Church and calling for reform, and so and so in that sense, he it says he laid the egg that Luther hatched, uh, and his his trans his critiques of Jerome's Vulgate and his you know he had better equipped with languages in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek than a lot of people of his time, and you had a lot of the people fleeing Constantinople, uh, particularly the Orthodox tradition, bringing manuscripts of, of, of Greek that uh, and they were coming like refugees today when they're fleeing from Syria. These were fleeing from Constantinople because of the Muslim takeover, and uh, so they were coming up through Italy and coming through Eastern Europe. So he had access to all these languages, and so one element of him is he's he's really um, uh, critiquing the Roman Catholic Church, which many of the reformers picked up on, but he also believed in being loyal to the Roman Catholic Church. So he held together um, uh, gracious criticism, but criticism, and he did it in a variety of ways, through prose, through ch children's stories, through almost Aesop's fables types things, uh, but also through rigorous exegesis um, and theology. Um, but he wouldn't go as far as Luther and, of course, later Calvin or the Anabaptist, Schleitheim Confession. He, he believed, yes, criticism, but loyalty, and always doing it in an ironical and peaceful manner. And so he, 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 um, he, he transcends the tribalism of that left right, or in this case, obviously, the Roman Catholic or the Protestant traditions. And he, uh, in that sense, he's, inter he's an interesting comparison with Peterson, who, who trans, now he, he uh, I think Peterson more like Luther, at times, uh, he can be, he can come out with both a fist swinging, and that's more Luther, you know. And, <laughs> right. uh, and so, in that sense, the Erasmus, uh, side of, in that sense, Peterson would be attempting to transcend the, the tribes or the clans the, that get frozen into yeah. ideologies in that sense. Yeah. Um, but I think Peterson would be more like Luther in the sense that, um, you know, it said he, every eggshell he stepped on, he broke. You know, <laughs> where, where it says, uh, you know, Rasmus could walk on eggshells and not break them. <laughs> nimbleness and nuance in Erasmus that he would raise the same critical questions yeah. but he knew how to move around the terrain in a much more nuanced and refined manner whereas uh, a Luther and Peterson at times will come with their in the ring and and, and uh, yeah. both fists swinging in that sense yeah yeah and so I find in Peterson he he waffles back and forth between um you know, deeply sensitive to, to suffering, to struggle, and to his own 
part on the journey and not sure where he's going and there's doubt and ambiguity. Uh, that's more harass me and you get drawn to that side. And then the other side, he'll come out, you know, uh, he's, he's got his shorts on and he's, he's whoever's <laughs> coming his way, he's going at them quicker than <laughs> they're going to come at him. That's the leaping <laughs> side. So it's like any complex human being, you know, they've got yep. two sides. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, part of what I've been thinking a lot about lately, um, you know, Charles Taylor's question that he opens a, a, secular, a secular age with, the secular age in terms of why, why here, you know, in the, in the 21st century, religious belief is so problematic, whereas in the 16th century, religious belief was so axiomatic and, and how we've taken this transition. And, and I found Peterson to be interesting, not, not necessarily even so much Peterson himself, but the impact that Peterson is having on people in terms of their openness once again to becoming religious and, and often Christian, often Orthodox, sometimes more Eastern strains, people will be interested in Peterson. And, and so as I've been digging into this over the last year and a half now, the, you know, a lot of my attention has gone back to the Reformation and the ideas that the, you know, Erasmus and the Reformers were wrestling with in terms of, you know, how to know the world. You had this, you had this at, at at that point, both with Erasmus and Luther, Calvin, you had this back to the sources movement where texts will be our guides. And obviously in the course of the Reformation, Luther elevates the text above the institution of the church, whereas you know, the traditional Roman Catholic understanding that the church is, is the steward of the texts and the tradition, but it's the institution that maintains this. So then you get that duality. And then, of course, after the Reformation, when we get, you know, another century or so, when, when now you have the Enlightenment, where instead of, you know, I'm, I'm working off some Philip Carey stuff, instead of, if you want to learn physics, you look to Aristotle, you know, that's back to the texts. Now with Newton and, and a number of these individuals, if you, if you want to learn, learn physics, you turn to the natural world. And you and you do experiments and you study and so in a sense, the empirical world is your text, not this page with with writing, all of which has history and of course now we're very aware of it, history and contextuality and it's embedded in culture, so on and so forth. And so when I began to look at as I've continued to dig into Peterson and my motivating question hasn't so much been Peterson himself, but rather why is Peterson, you know, and I've, I've used this term before, bread pill, in terms of turning people on to Christianity. Why is Peterson bread pilling people? And we talked about a little bit about this before. And, and often one name that comes up in this is Francis Schaeffer. Because now Francis Schaeffer, uh, back in the 70s, in, in many ways had, I think, a smaller, it's hard to know just how, big an impact Jordan Peterson will have, let's say if we look back on him 20 years from now. But, but Francis Schaeffer, especially in the American scene, had a pretty dramatic impact on certain high status individuals, for example, like Chuck Colson, who Chuck Colson, you know, he's one of Nixon's henchmen. He's, he's his hatchet man. He winds up going to prison. But part of the reason he goes to prison, if you read uh, Colson's, you know, kind of coming out Christian book, born again, you know, is very much tied into this. He, he becomes kind of this Anglican, mainline, secularist Christian, and via Francis Schaeffer, via evangelicalism, then becomes this evangelical Christian who now has something similar to, let's say, the tradition I was raised in, this world in light, this Calvinist, neo kyperian world in life view, and off he goes. So, I mean, I can, I can use all these things with you because I've got a fair degree, a fair amount of certainty. You know all this crazy language I'm talking, which to me is all this insular Dutch Calvinist Calvin College language. 
And, and so then Peterson comes on the stage and I, I see all of these people and every day I get letters from them that say things like, I was big into Sam Harris, either I was raised with no religion or I was raised kind of with some religion. I became, when I became a teenager or when I was in college, I, I looked at all this stuff and I looked at science and said, the Bible is a bunch of hooey. Now I listen to Jordan Peterson and I think, oh, maybe it isn't hooey. And, and it's, in fact, for many of these people, it was his biblical lectures that when they listened to him, suddenly he gave the Bible credibility while Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, William Lane Craig, all these modernistic all these modernistic apologists who are out there, you know, doing their thing, they didn't get any audience at all. Jordan Peterson comes up and says, boy, you know, the, the tree in the garden and the snake, well, that snake is, you know, we had developed pattern recognition. So he kind of uses Darwin and the Bible creates sort of a new synthesis and thousands of people listen to this and say, gosh, I should turn back and look at this text. And I think, huh, isn't that interesting? What on earth is happening? Hmm. So I don't know, any thoughts on that? I just dumped a whole bunch of stuff on you. No, there, I mean, the points you're raising, I think are quite significant in that uh, what happened, um, obviously, with elements of the right wing of the Enlightenment anyway, not the centrist or romantic wing, the, the humanist and romantic were still open to religion, and they were trying to synthesize um, religion and science. So whether in Germany, Goethe or Hegel or Kant, or you had the romantic wing in England, um, it was only in the right wing of the Enlightenment that a certain, a narrow view of science, not a, a more nuanced view of science, um, came to dominate. What that did is that a more right wing of the Enlightenment tended um, to repress or dismiss religion or the claims of religion because it couldn't be verified and falsified through a certain very narrow methodology, mm -hmm. uh, either inductive, deductive, logical, empirical, um, you name it. And so we went, and that came to dominate of the three wings of the Enlightenment. It was that right wing, scientistic, it wasn't even good science. Uh, it came to dominate, and, it, and in marginalizing religion, um, the implications of that was that why would thoughtful people, as we move into the future, be interested in religion? Because the new religion is science. Okay, and scientists are the new priests, and Stanford is the new Vatican, as it were, you know? And so, um, and so whether it's psychology, or whether it's you know biology, chemistry, physics, or mathematics, these became the new sources um, of authority, but what um, what science can't answer is is the deeper longings of the human heart for meaning and for purpose, either in a transcendent sense or what that means in an eminent, you know, um, our journey through time. But what happened in the biblical element is you had um, two directions were taken, and I think this is where Peterson. Is, is, is carving a, a very significant path, which actually it's, is very classical in what he's doing. But the right wing of the Enlightenment, those who followed certain elements of, say, biblical criticism, and those who went even further down that road, they essentially just dismissed the text as irrelevant. It was a collection of tales of people from another period of time that um, was absolutely irrelevant for our time, a scientific world, a rational world, a thoughtful world. Uh, and then there was elements within the Reformed tradition, whether, you know, Calvinist, Luther, elements, um, uh, other traditions that said, well, the way to approach the Bible is in a literal, historical, grammatical way. Um, and so it lost the contemplative, the mythical, the mystical element in which, um, uh, in which the patristic thinkers of the East and the West, whether in Augustine or um, Ambrose or Gregory of Nyssa or Chrysostom, in which they were asking, as you say, so what's these myths mean? Now, if you say myth for someone from a, you know, a reformed or an evangelical tradition, it's what do you mean the Bible is myth? Uh, and they think myth equals illusion, or uh, you want to have hard empirical evidence, just like science, because you want to compete with science on its terms. I mean, Peterson can do that. He's a scientist trained in the sciences of the human soul and 
and, and count. But he also realizes the limitations of science. And he recognizes very clearly where myth can speak to people. So he'll take, you know, he'll take the various myths or story from Genesis, and he's not going to be hung up on the historic uh, historicity of them. He'll, his, his question is almost what a spiritual director would ask. So what does the story mean for you on your journey in terms of the shadow, the dark side, the, you know, maybe the, the serpent in you that you're listening to, or the angel of light that you're being deceived by? And all of a sudden, people can say, oh, this speaks to me on my journey, so the text becomes personally relevant when exegeted in a different way. Because with the fathers and the mothers of the church, there were six levels of interpretation. And the lowest was the literal, grammatical, historical, uh, which serves its place, and, and, and it's not to be tossed out. Uh, but there's also more nuanced and layered levels of interpreting the text. And I think the appeal of Peterson uh, is that he's saying, Listen, these and this is why he gets large turnouts, both the University or Toronto, where he's giving the lectures on um, the Bible, uh, but also his many, you know, lectures that are videoed as well. Is he's he's pointing out the perennial relevance of the stories of the Bible to today's setting and context, and saying the genius of the Bible is it transcends uh, it, it transcends time and history and speaks to the human soul cross time in history. So the very myths or the stories told in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, or the historic books or the prophetic books, they're as relevant for us today as then. Uh, don't get hooked up uh, or fighting about little unnecessary historic details. You know, Did the ark line, land on a rare rack? And can we find pieces of the wood that can verify the Bibles? <laughs> or is the earth 6,000 years old because it's day, day, day? No. For him, it's, that's not even the purpose. A friend of mine has just finished a book. He teaches at Trinity on um, Trinity Western up in Langley here. It's looking at the uh, how the fathers approached Genesis. And of course, they never approached it in a literal, a literal manner in terms of, uh, they were always looking at the allegorical, the anagogical, the typological, uh, the, the mystical, the ecclesial ways, the Christological ways of interpreting the text, the anthropological ways. And that's what Peterson's appeal. And so, as you were mentioning earlier, I've had many students who, one, have had no background in Christianity or grew up in some form of a reformed or conservative evangelical or charismatic. And these are all being brought to Christianity through Peterson's very, I won't say new, it's really just an old approach to exegeting the text that speaks to people on their all too human journey. And in that sense, he's drawing a lot of people in, in both his honesty and doubting way, as he's feeling his way forward, but also his interpreting the text in a way that speaks to people in the depths of who they are and the questions that they're asking on their, on their life journey or faith journey. Does that make sense? Or? Oh, yeah. Why do you think he's been so much more effective than the thousands of preachers like me. And now you've got preachers on both sides because in some ways he's, you know, so you've got say evangelical preachers who want to be effective in terms of increasing their tribe and conversion and all that. But you've got plenty of mainliners out there that in some ways have been working similar things. They don't, they don't care that much about the historicity, but they want to work the, you know, the, what, what is the meaning? What does the snake say to me? So on and so forth. And, and neither the mainline nor the evangelicals. Now, of course, I'm not going to say that the evangelicals haven't been effective in their own ways, but, but Peterson has managed to reach a group of people that in my experience have been highly resistant to evangelical appeals. And, and so that was obvious to me, but also a group of people that if they would wander into a mainline church, would probably just kind of shrug and wander back out again, whereas Peterson, for some reason, grabs their attention. Is it his, is it, are, is it his scientific credibility that you think grabbed on to especially some of those who had been attractive to the light of, of Sam Harris, let's say, and the New Atheists? Well, I think, I, yeah, I think there's a variety of ways uh, by which people are approaching Peterson. And I think long before he was doing the, the biblical studies, he was engaging the larger 
political issues of political correctness yeah. in which people were feeling a sense that something isn't quite right here. You know, uh, I, I feel an unease or what Taylor would say, a certain malaise or what George Grant would call intimations of betrayal. Um, and, and so his first appearance on the public, because he really wasn't known in any significant way until B, you know, C-16 right. came out. And so the initial introduction for many, well, here's someone who's speaking almost prophetically in some ways of saying there are standards higher than these three tribes that I mentioned earlier, and you need not buy into one of the three. Um, and so I think for many, this was, oh, here's someone with integrity, and they're paying the price publicly for speaking with integrity. Mm -hmm. And people are looking for that. I think any mm -hmm. honest person is looking for someone who, uh, first of all, is aware um, that there are these contradictory tensions in our culture intellectually, and that you get people saluting or genuflecting at different tribes, but none, none of these positions are intellectually coherent or convincing. And someone comes along and says, the emperor has no clothes on, essentially. And so I think this was the initial storefront uh, that drew a lot, of, a lot of people. And he was someone who was willing to pay the price. He was beat up a lot by the liberal Sanhedrin. Uh, they would attack him constantly. Uh, and then, but he would also say, I'm not a part of the alt-right. And as much as you think, just because I critique the left doesn't mean I um, simplistically am devoted to the alt-right either. So where you have people saying, I'm looking for... A, a better, a higher vision, he was feeling his way towards that, and he continues to do so. Yeah. Uh, and he takes, he, he, he you know, he, he, he feels the slings and arrows of that. And it was, I think, from people initially being drawn into that, and also he has the background, obviously, he can talk with a Sam Harris, the new atheist, do you want to do science? I'm a scientist, we want to play that game. I can point out to you very clearly both the appeal of science as understood in different ways, and the limitations of science, what it reveals, what it conceals. Uh, so the scientific way of knowing must also be balanced by the wisdom way of knowing, the insight way of knowing. And this is where myth and story and narrative. But I think the initial attraction was someone who is willing to uh, come on the public front stage and face the ire of oppositions for saying um, the emperor has no clothes on. Then it was, as they began to trust him, Hmm. Uh, in his journey, and then he starts going into biblical studies. Uh, what he's doing in biblical studies is not new, but I think he's earned a certain pedigree for the price he has paid for being publicly responsible with difficult issues. And, and people said, well, this is a guy with integrity. Now he's doing the Bible. Now, why is someone with integrity turning to the Bible? <laughs> well, I'm going to follow him on that one. Okay, so let's go, let's go down that yellow brick road and see where it goes. And he's giving a read of the Bible for some of them, either who know nothing about it or have turned to Eastern religions yeah. or have a literal grammatical historic read that yeah. they've grown up on, but it doesn't speak to them. Yeah. And he's saying, here's a way of reading the text that makes it perennially relevant. And they say, aha, Eureka. And then they're drawn into it. And then the Bible then takes on a whole new vigor and vitality and dynamism for them on their, their life or, or faith pilgrimage that some of the other exegetes can be either too dry, too academic, or a simplistic read of the text that doesn't speak to people or a devotional approach that it, it's not appealing to their mind. Um, so he's bringing together heart and head, uh, imagination and mind, myth and history it's a, it's quite a synthesis that he's that he's bringing together so so i think the um if, let me just re, um, sort of reframe this i think it's his initial coming on the stage people trusting him then he goes on to and then also the people he'll touch in philosophy you know nietzsche heidegger kierkegaard right. many of these key and so again this well this guy's this you know he's, he, he's not only just sort of a a, a public figure. He's also read good works of philosophy and literature, and yeah. uh, and now because people like uh, surely 
read the Bible. I mean, that's something that, you know, your fundamentalists do or your conservatives. But all of a sudden now he's doing the Bible. And so you can read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and you can, you can know Nietzsche and you can um, be a clinical psychologist. and You can be in the center of the culture wars and you still read the Bible. Okay. So, this, <laughs> so, it's, it's, so I think it's this breadth to him that he catches different people at different points of their, their questioning. Yeah. And then yeah. he draws them and says, listen, there's a deeper well from which uh, I'm dropping my bucket and there's life giving waters. And this text, the Bible, has waters that are pretty fresh and pretty nourishing that slake the thirst of the human spirit and soul for for meaning. Yeah. So where do you think what do you think is going to happen to this group? That's been a big interest of mine, too, because so so you watch a video and you listen to Peterson and it's a it's a fascinating idea that people begin to trust him. One of the things if you go to what I call his evangelistic crusade, which is this thing that masks as a book tour, which seems to be how he's making writing his second book, as he said in a recent interview, you if you go to the VIP um, event afterwards, what you see is usually about 150 people who will line up to get their picture, shake his hand, so on and so forth. And so when I did this, I kind of sat close so I could be nosy and over, because I'm obviously a nosy person to do what I do. I wanted to hear what kind of things people were saying to him. And it's exactly as he says they are, and that people are coming up to him and they've said, you know, I, I read your book. I've listened to your, I've listened to all of your lectures. I've, cleaned my room. I've, I'm, I'm trying to stop lying or at least tell the truth. I'm, I'm fixing up my relationships with, with the significant people around me. And you've made my life demonstrably better. And this for Peterson is obviously a big part of his motivation. Whenever he gets asked questions about this, he, it's, it's clearly, this is, this for him is part of I mean, if you had to have Jordan Peterson sit down and write a life mission statement, it would be to, to help individuals have a better life. So there's his part as a clinical psychologist. So he's, he's having this impact. People are cleaning their room. I've been running meetups. I continue to find people who are saying his work was in, incredibly helpful to me. You know, now this is obviously being conveyed not via an institution like a church where you have a regular community of people with all of the upsides and downsides of that real life, but you just have it via this social media platform of YouTube and, and a book to a certain degree, which is obviously kind of an older social media. But where's, what are these people going to do? They've got their room clean. They're, you know, they're, they've patched up things with their father. They're doing less porn. They're drinking less. They're, they're looking for a job. I mean, all these things are good things. And I think all of us can celebrate this kind of initiative on the individual level. My concern as a pastor was I watched this and I think, yeah, long-term, you work with someone long-term and you have this phase, this initial phase, you know, they, they, they start, they drink less, they clean their room, they straighten out their relationships. But that's like the initial phase. And as a pastor, I know you're going to have to sustain this. And there are going to be bumps in the road that come up and stumbles. There's going to be cancer and divorce and um, unemployment. And, you know, all these things come in terms of the long-term picture. So I see all of these people sort of reawakening with Peterson. And my concern has been, where are these people going to go? Or will this just be the little Peterson episode of their lives. So any thoughts on that? Because you're dealing with students. And for students, obviously, you see them in this little niche of their university education, and off they go into the world. So thoughts on that? Yeah, very good point. And uh, I think those questions are absolutely valid and vital to ask. And in that sense, Peterson is good at um, getting the key in the ignition for many people, uh, getting them into first gear, but inevitably you have to translate the personal, the individual, either into the communal, into the ecclesial, into the corporate. And this is where you, you run into people that are different from yourself. They see things differently, temperamentally the different. As you mentioned, there are seasons in life of you know, the hatch match dispatch in terms of people's journey, the, as it were the births, <laughs> the weddings and the deaths, um, um, ideological clashes. Um, and that's the nature of the transition from the personal uh, 
the personal and the individual into the corporate, the communal, or in a Christian sense, the ecclesial sense. And then, of course, there's the public dimensions of faith. It's always the triple cord of, of anyone as they're trying to make sense of, of the journey. His strength, uh, I think, is as you rightly comment, and as I think as many people are finding helpful, he's assisting them um, to get out of a morass of which they don't even know how to na navigate and in terms of identity and their own future and direction when often they feel debilitated and uh, beat down and, and in terms of the larger cultural issues almost silenced by daring to raise substantive questions about certain movements and he's saying he's saying wake up um, grow up um, uh, step into the north wind uh, you're going to become a different person but in stepping into it then there's the, the movement towards so what's this look like when you shift into second third fourth and fifth year in your life in your life journey and in that sense it reminds me a lot of one of my favorite authors you may have read to me was very popular in the 50s 60s 70s won the nobel prize in 46 for literature herman hesse his great work is the glass bead game some know him for smaller works but the glass bead game is it's really the story of these sophisticated intellectuals the castellians who synthesized all sorts of ideas and brought them together the best that had been thought and said and they lived in these mountaintop villages um, and the trained in the finest of schools and bringing together philosophy and theology the arts music culture literature throughout time and history um, but the big question that I always asked is them was so what's the relationship of that to the valley where you have to go from the mountain peak to mountain ridges and translate this and, and, and what Hess very much is uh, aware, acutely aware of this dilemma. It's one thing to be energized, to be challenged to think more deeply about one's own personal journey and, and engage in the task of changing our life direction in some sense. Uh, it's quite another thing to say, so what's the relationship to that when I bump heads with someone in a community or my work environment or in a church context or a parish or a con congregation? And then what's this mean for faithful commitment to public political life in the hot, hot button issues? Um, I think I think Peterson's appeal is he's good on the first set of questions, whether he develops in his own thinking to say, okay, my next book is not just about telling stories and getting off, getting off your bed and, you know, as it were, uh, moving out into the world, facing your shadow, your, your demons, but moving this and what's this mean corporately? I mean, any good book, if he builds on it, his next book should be on the corporate element, the communal element, depending where he goes with the ecclesia. Because you can't read the Bible and not eventually translate, obviously, into Jewish context, the nation, and certainly in the Hebrew and the Old Testament, and certainly in the New Testament, the church. So a part of that quest, if you separate a Christology or an exegesis from an ecclesiology, it's cherry picking with the myths you're yep. using. Yep. And so he has to be very careful that in, in, in using a text, he's not so cherry picking that um, he's reducing the fullness of the text or the Catholicity of the text to just private interpretations and personal transformation, but not corporate communal or ecclesia and then and also then where that leads into public discourse in the larger political economic social environmental eco so i don't know what degree and if he will make that if he doesn't he'll be going what rilke says round and round in the smallest circle turns mm. and people will be drawn into that but people are asking bigger questions of saying okay i'm sort of with you on what you're trying to do up to this point i may have some questions about how you're doing it but i'm generally with you in that you're asking people to you know um, to as it were face into the, the storm of life both internally and the bigger issues and stop using excuses or slipping into cynicism or skepticism um, because you don't like this party or that person or that community and it's not because often when the perfect becomes the enemy of the good um, people then slip into you know paralyzed cynicism and he's saying that's a cop-out that's an indulgence and so he calls people to break free from the shackles of cynicism and skepticism. Uh, he points out how they might do that personally, but how do you do that corporately when actually it's more than just interior resistance, but now you have people 
who are opposing you or questioning. Uh, right. um, how do you then deal with that? And to the degree he makes that transition in terms of the question you're asking will will determine whether he becomes a more significant public person yeah. or whether he'll just appeal to people who are concerned with the personal and the individual and the private. And to the degree he does that, he'll eventually fade off, just as you may remember the men's movement of the 90s, you know, Robert Bly, yeah. Iron John, you know, it had about a 10 year, a 10 year yeah. period. It was all about the personal yeah. and me facing the wild man and, you know, versus yeah. the, the sanitized, the bourgeois person. Yeah. And in that sense, Peterson could just become the Robert Bly of the first decade or the second decade of the 21st century if he yep. doesn't move beyond that. So yes, so the question you're asking about the corporate and the public, they're absolutely essential. And if he doesn't move that way, he'll, he'll, his audience will soon be um, exhausted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then people then move on to uh, asking deeper questions about, so what's this mean for the Castalians is we have to move from thinking, stitching together ideas to translating it into life in the valley. Yeah. Uh, and if we can't do that, so what? This is another just what T.S. Eliot would talk about being distracted by distraction through distractions in the four <laughs> quartets. And so, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely pertinent. And I would say imperative questions in terms of, and if he doesn't move it, as I mentioned, he'd be like Robert Bly, uh, you, know, ten, you know, 10 rules for life. is just Iron John in a 21st century yep. garments. That's all. And many, and many of the people listening to this have no idea who Robert Bly is because, yes. and that, which is exactly your point that it's just kind of gone away. One of the, a little aphorism that I think comes from Oz Guinness. He makes the point that without individuals, nothing changes, but without institutions, nothing lasts. And exactly. I've been thinking that again and again during this Peterson chapter. And one, one name that comes up often when, at least amongst reformed, conservative reformed circles, when we talk about Peterson, is he reminds a number of people of, of Francis Schaeffer. And again, I mentioned Francis Schaeffer's connection with then Chuck, um, Chuck um, Colson and, and that whole chapter. And, and Colson was a significant, you know, had a significant impact longitudinally in some certain segments of the American church and in American politics to a degree. Now you had a little bit of experience, but one of the things that Francis Schaeffer did with his temporary um, fame, but he did establish an institution. And one of the things that I, I hadn't thought about Francis Schaeffer since I remember my father reading his books in the seventies until I started getting notes from a guy in Brazil who was saying, I'm coming to Sacramento because I'm going to be at McGeorge Law School for a little while. And uh, can you help me find an apartment? I'm thinking, why is this guy from Brazil writing me? And eventually things kind of worked out and he got here and I learned, well, I've been very tightly connected with Labrie in Brazil and suddenly Labrie. And I thought, is that still around? <laughs> but apparently it is. And now, and then when I was talking to you a little bit, you shared that you're a little bit older than I am, and you had a little bit of experience with Labrie and and Schaefer, and and you want to, you know, and it, do you think there's any when you think about Jordan Peterson and Francis Schaefer, how do those two characters sit in your head? Well, as you say, I lived at Labrie from 1973 to 1974. I lived right beside Oz Guinness. Oh, uh, really? Yes, yeah. So Oz and I used to go down and down into Interlaken or we'd go to the Zermatt and go book hunting on weekends. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so his book Dust of Death had just come out at that point. And that would have been 19, I think, probably 73, 74. Yeah. Timothy Leary was up there. Maharishi Mehash, Yogi Bob Dylan was up. There. I mean, it was all the countercultural types and the uh, so Labrie really emerged in the late 50s at th uh, throughout the 60s. Uh, 70s, and, and of course, as Francis Schaeffer uh, was diagnosed with cancer by the um, early 80s, it had lost its substantive momentum, either in Switzerland, Holland, England. We have uh, a Labrie out here in Bowen Island, uh, who actually just moved on to the Vancouver Island. But as an institution, uh, yes, it, it, it still exists, but certainly not with the um, uh, prominence 
it once did. I would say that, what, uh, I mean, obviously the um, similarities between Francis Schaeffer and Eugene Peterson is or they're Jordan both- Jordan Peterson. Yeah, who, who did I say? You said Eugene Peterson, who's a oh, whole other, yes. who, no, who you and I know who he is. A lot of people who listen to me don't know who Eugene yes, Peterson is. Yes, yeah, my, my <laughs> wife studied with Eugene Peterson. Actually brought, uh, first time Eugene Peterson met Jim Wallace, I brought them together. Oh, really? Yes, that was about probably 20 years ago. Oh, Eugene interesting. Had never met Jim Wallace, and uh, Jim was wanting to meet Eugene. They were both here on the West Coast, so I said, well, let's do a lunch together. So it, it was sat, uh, fascinating, because Eugene comes from that more centrist evangelical, right. and Jim more with, uh, with um, the, the uh, sojourners, the soft left anarchist. Uh, even. But back to Francis Schaeffer, yeah. Um, so where Francis Schaeffer, what he shares with Eugene Peterson is both were really speaking to the questions of their time uh, and, and both had an um, interdisciplinary breadth. So Francis Schaeffer, whether it was the, um, you know, whether it was art, so would say art with the Rookmacher up in Holland, um, music. I also lived, uh, so Oz Guinness lived on one side of where I was and Betty Smith and the musicians lived just the other uh, chalet down so in Waymo. And then the Schaeffers began in Waymo and then moved up to, to Villar, which was just, the next village. I was actually the only person ever baptized in their bathtub. <laughs> yeah. He'd taken people through a bit of a catechism and he said, well, um, you know, I'll sprinkle you with water here. And I said, you know, I love sort of the image or the metaphor of immersion. He says, I'm not taking you out in a frozen this <laughs> winter going into a lake. He says, that's just a no-no. He says, I'll tell you, I'll bring all the Labrie community up. We'll put on a big dinner at our chalet in Villar. I'll fill the tub halfway up and then we'll put you under. Would that be all right, I said, that's great. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> well, that's so, a great story. Yeah. So so I think so in terms of Francis Schaefer and um, Jordan Peterson, they both address some of the deeper questions and longings that their generation or elements of their generation are asking. They do it from an interdisciplinary perspective. Where they differ was obviously with, with um, because I come from near the States would be an Episcopal, but in Canada or the Anglo-Canadian, it's an Anglican, um, which is not, we have the Calvinist reformed wing, but it's more of a wing. It's not the, the core of, of, of that tradition. Now, Francis Schaeffer came from, in one sense, as he moved through his life increasingly um, confessionally reformed and uh, increasing a narrower approach to that and once you got through once you got through the um sort of the storefront in terms of the uh, appeal of this broad multicultural interdisciplinary wide reading uh, schaefer was not particularly a deep reader uh, but back of it all was a reform confessional theology which was highly problematic for many people yeah. so you'd be drawn be drawn to one element uh, because there were not a lot of christians in the 50s, 60s 70s that were as widely interested in the, the richness of historic culture and and how christians you know were, were making sense of that or interpreting it in terms of sex docs you know all of this um uh uh, now, Peterson isn't reformed in that sense, and he has a breadth to him yeah. that Schaefer doesn't. And I think one of his appeals as a Castellian in that sense, uh, he will appeal to a generation that is asking far deeper, broader questions that Schaefer wouldn't have been able to address with a reform perspective. Yeah. And he's more classical. He's inching towards classical thinking he's not there he doesn't substantively understand it but he's hiking down that trail yeah. and in that sense that there's a there's a an invitational fullness to peterson that that um that she, now schaefer, schaefer at his best was a gentler soul because he'd seen some terrible um ecclesial theological wars that had damaged a lot of people mm. uh and so at his best he wasn't as punchy as peterson mm -hmm. Uh, and so I don't know how Peterson will go with that as he faces his own demon of punchiness, yeah. you know, and when he's cornered, can he come back graciously and kindly and say, I beg to differ with you, but, yeah. you know, we, we need not, 
put our boxing gloves on and pull out our pistols and shoot one another. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me because I, so I grew up kind of in the CRC left wing. So I was very much the Calvin College Reform Journal, that tribe. And so Schaefer and Colson, because of our politics, they were persona non gratas. Now through this thing, everybody's saying Schaefer, Schaefer, Schaefer. So I've, I've tried to read some Schaefer. And every time I read Schaefer, I have very much the same, what you described. I, I he's, Whereas I'm comfortable with a, well, obviously I'm comfortable with a conserve, conservative, reformed, confessional posture. This is the tribe I've grown up with. I'm not afraid or reactive to that at all because that's the people I come from. At the same time, I read Schaefer and I just don't see a lot there there. Whereas I've had, I've found Peterson far more interesting, not so much necessarily from, partly from Peterson himself, but one of the things that I think Peterson has really done is open up a lot of classical material and interesting conversation for people that there was no platform or opportunity really to dig into these things. And so he's been a popularizer of a lot of the classics for a good number of people. And yeah, I think that's another good point you made. He's uh, Peterson, like Schaefer, were po they're popularizers. Yeah. And some people more sophisticated academically say, well, this is paper thin. Yeah. And in a sense, yes, but you have to, everyone has to start somewhere. And if you want to get into the richness of Kierkegaard or Dostoevsky or Nietzsche, uh, uh, you know, or Heidegger, that's, you're not going to have someone doing a public lecture on the, the nuanced approach of Nietzsche or, you know, I'm teaching a course on or stuff on Nietzsche this this semester, and and you know if you were to ask Peterson, Peterson, you know, well, you know, flesh this out deeper and further in a you know short little clip. That's not the place for it. And so merely to pick on someone because they've taken a couple of lines from a text in a public lecture, that's missing the point. The 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 public forum is not a place when you're doing something more popular way to go into a sophisticated exegesis that puts people to sleep. Um, it's to give them a taste, to, to, um, to um, enrich their palate, to give them, give them a hunger for something. And so people sometimes when they come after him and say, well, you're not giving it, or even when he does, you know, Siddhartha or Buddha in his journey, well, if certain Buddhists come, well, that's, you know, a misread of Siddhartha. You know, so you're missing the point. Um, uh, he, he's a, he's giving people a taste. He's pointing. He's he's um, addressing a hunger. Uh, if you want the sophisticated stuff, Peterson's not the person to go. But for people who are casting about in a in an era in a place where meaning has been deprived and religion has been caricatured, um, then he's trying to say there is there's a mother load here. Uh, and this is the pathway to it. There's a well here. There's ancient wells here. Uh, don't deny they exist. Yeah. Or there are implications for the health of the soul. Yes, yes. Well, and, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, Francis Schaeffer, because he came at this as a confessional Christian, a bunch of, even though he's baptizing you in his tub, there, there still is this tradition of the body, the corporate body, that I, I, can, I can think amazing thoughts, I can have a transcendent experience, but this, this will fundamentally be uh, transitory unless I can transcend my own individualism and become part of a corporate body. And, and that then, because of Francis Schaeffer's connection to the broader tradition of a church, even if in Protestant fashion, oh, we have the idea of a church, so we're going to make up our own, which of course the Catholics and the Orthodox look at it and say, oh, great, you know, you, you can't reproduce this, uh, but that's what Protestants are obviously always doing. Or, Here, me and me and my pals on the beach, we'll, we'll have communion, just us, and you know, that's, that's the Protestant spirit. So, but at least Schaefer had that, so then he leaves in his wake an institutional thing. One of the things I've been watching for Peterson is while he's now, especially with the death of Patreon, been kind of upping his attempt to remake the university, which I hear and I always think, well, that's very Protestant of you because that's how the Catholics look at the church. You're going to remake this thing? Good luck, buddy. Um, 
But at the same time, in terms of Peterson and the church, someone who very famously doesn't go to church, doesn't identify as a Christian in any confessional sense. And, and so that, that, again, for me, which is actually part of the reason I started doing the YouTube thing was I said, where are these people going to go? Because I just imagined somebody who, a university student, hears about Peterson, gets excited, cleans his room, cuts down on his drinking, decides to make a permanent commitment to a, to a partner, you know, takes the initial steps, and then shows up in a church somewhere. Wow. And, <laughs> and because the, it says to the preacher, yeah, I've been listening to Jordan Peterson. And the preacher says, you mean Eugene Peterson? The, no, Jordan Peterson. Well, who's that? <laughs> Now, obviously, with Peterson's heightened, heightened visibility, more people will say, yeah, but you go into an evangelical church, and they'll say, yeah, Peterson, he believes in Darwin. You go into a mainline church, and they'll say, yeah, Peterson is the custodian of the patriarchy. Well, there you've got an entire, who knows how big, cohort within a generation saying, I want to start going deeper, but how can I do this? Who will help me? That's right, because we have a lot of immature shepherds in the church who have been, uh, sadly so, taken the Kool-Aid in their seminary or Bible school, and they don't know how to think out of a fairly um, narrow approach to how you engage culture or how you encourage parishioners uh, to, I mean, if faith is about light, you know, yeast engaging culture and people of faith should be bilingual in that sense they should know the language of their own heritage but they need to know the language of their their culture and to speak and peterson has the ability to do that schaefer had the ability to do that they were bilingual and that takes some work it, it takes a lot of uh, um, homework it takes a lot of reading it takes a lot of thinking it takes a lot of soul searching um, but that's what another thing I would think Schaefer and Peterson would share was that bilingualism. And sometimes, as you say, when people will come to a church from really being smitten maybe by Schaefer or, or, I mean, I would, when I came back in the early seventies, you know, and spending, you know, 1973, 1974 at Labrie, um, you know, many of the parishioners had never read any of this stuff. They lived in a, um, in a fairly insulated, ghetto-ish ecclesial community, even though Anglican is supposed to be a magisterial tradition, as is the Reformed tradition, engaging the world that you live in. But many have turned aside from that. And so it becomes, uh, for people like Schaefer and Peterson, they become the... Um, canaries sort of in the mine shaft you know that says something's not wrong there's toxins coming up and and they often pay the price for doing so um, um and so but yeah so you then people go into a church and it's well that what's this got to do with schaefer what's this got to do with uh, peterson uh and so when you when you have shepherds or pastors or priests or ministers or whatever that are not fully um, equipped and trained to be bilingual and they can only speak the speech of their congregation or denomination, it leaves them inept and impotent in teams of dealing with the big questions younger people are asking and those who they respect as their shepherds. So in that yeah. sense, Peterson is a pastor yeah. and a shepherd to people and hopefully he can be a bit of a bridge between two worlds. Yeah. History will reveal that, whether that's the case or not. I was going to say one thing about Schaefer, which is, uh, in many ways, uh, some people have missed his his early environmental work. So, for example, Pollution and the Death of Man. That was one of the first books out that went after Lynn White, and whom blame, was blaming Christianity for our environmental clash uh, intentions. And Schaefer saw very clearly that, um, that um, one, there was a whole intellectual school of people who were blaming Christianity for the environmental crisis. And Schaefer said, no, 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 it's not Christianity. There's, there's forces at work in terms of secularization and um, a certain understanding of science and, uh, and technology which emerges from that. And it's, it's Christians who, when they understand Genesis and other texts properly, they're the stewards of, of creation. He was writing this long before you know the environmental issue has become front stage in the way it has today and so sometimes back of um, you know 
I mean, his end point was elements of reformed, reformed um, theology in a, in a bit of a, a narrower confessional way. But there was, there was much good in him that anticipated um, some of the big issues that we face today. Perhaps he didn't have the depth um, just because he didn't have the reading experience. And at Labrie, they were so busy. But again, he translated things to, this is not an individual thing. Yeah. It's not community in terms of intuition. It's living community. Yep. Uh, you know, so we would, half a day, we'd be chopping wood. We'd be working together, cutting lawns. Half a day, you'd be studying. Half a day, uh, at the end of the day, there'd be public lectures. People hmm. would be coming from all over, and then there'd be the tapes. And so it was almost a form of a classical, liturgical, educational hmm. context, which you didn't find in seminaries, you didn't find in universities, you didn't find in churches. Yeah. It was this highly creative approach to, to community, to thinking, to physical exercise, yeah. to contributing to the life of the community through three or four hours a day of work. Yeah. Um, so there was a, so, I mean, Peterson has never made that jump. No, no. He's too much on the big lecture circuit and make, making big money. And, uh, the Schaefer's were, there was a, there was a humility, a communal sense, uh, working with the difficult questions, drug addicts and all sorts of stuff would turn up all sorts of counterculture. Pa he and Edith patiently there, Oz Guinness was doing, he just married his uh, a woman. She was a former model from New York at the time. Um, they were, they had an understanding of the relationship of the personhood and community and then public. And Schaefer couldn't be reduced to right or left either because near the end it was the abortion, but he's also, uh, you also had all the counterculture, anti-Vietnam War people, the yeah. ecological issues. Well, that's usually seen as on the left. Yeah. Abortion yeah. is seen as on the right. Yeah. He transcended that tribalism. And in that sense, he would share that with Peterson. Uh, but uh, I would say, yeah, the weakness of Peterson, as you've rightly mentioned, is a lack of substantive communal yep. thinking. Yep. And uh, much will hinge on whether he sees the next stage of this educational direction he may be going as his understanding of CUNY. But if it's so, that's still not community. That's still Castalians playing with ideas. Yeah, um, yeah. The task of any mature person is how you bring together theory and praxis yes. and how that's done, not individually, but communally and then publicly. Yes. And it's that triple chord of, of the theory and practice at a, at a personal, a communal and a public way that is the mark of a mature thinker, uh, either theologically or exegetically, philosophically, ecclesially, and then larger, as I mentioned earlier, economic, social, ecological Yep. war and peace issues yeah so so it, it'll be interesting to see where he goes or whether as i mentioned earlier he's just like robert Bly. he has his his season his moment in the sun yeah. five ten years or 15 years from now no one will ever have heard of him no more than they know of robert Bly or the men's movement of the yep. 1990s yep yep well I, I i ron this has been this has been terrific and we've touched on a bunch of things anything in particular that you wanted to touch on that i didn't lead us into oh no i think that way i think we we uh, rambled and galloped across all sorts of terrain <laughs> <laughs> i sat on your saddle and you sat on my saddle <laughs> we both the reins for one another i think that was great well good well good well well thank you so much ron for for taking the time to do this and i'll post this i'll post this this afternoon almost because i i thought this was a very i i thought this was a very helpful conversation and I think a lot of the people who are listening to my channel will 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 find this helpful so I think again if um, you can look up Ron on the internet he's got some really good conversations that's where I first heard about Ron conversations with Brad Jer how do you say Jersak or oh, yeah, Brad Jersak yeah we started the Clarion Journal um, probably 20 years ago with the former Archbishop of the Canadian Orthodox Church and so Clarion uh, Journal we have a lot of um, a lot of articles from people from diverse denominational theological backgrounds. But yeah, Brad, uh, I supervised Brad's PhD uh, okay. that he did it in Bangor and Wales on uh, George Grant, very well-known Canadian political philosopher, and Simon Bai, um, who okay. was a sort of diatema of sort. Yeah, Brian, li uh, Brad lives in Abbotsford where I do. Yeah, oh, okay. We just had coffee with him last week, yeah. Okay. 
Well, that's that's wonderful, and and it's it's very interesting because you've had a you you've had your own very interesting journey with a bunch of who's who's of the of the the late twentieth and now early twenty first centuries with in some of these areas. That's fascinating. Yeah, no, it's it's been a privilege to you know in my late teens, early twenties, uh, reading a lot of the. Um, Schaefer material corresponded with a lot of the beats like Allen Ginsberg and um, and some of those people were at Labrie uh, when I was there and uh, yeah and then doing um, graduate studies I, I at Regent College in the late seventies early eighties had some of the key people there some know Jim Packer for example yeah. who sort of an elder statesman of the Calvinist yeah. tradition. And then Regent was moving in a very, its other element was a strong Catholic dimension. So I did my work on patristics. This is where when Peterson does his work on um, layered exegesis. That's, I mean, I was in my twenties, I was doing all that. And do you know Hans Borsma it comes from a- Yeah, a little yeah. bit. I've, I've- yeah. He just again. won the top, yeah. He just won the top theological award in 218 for his book, um, from Christianity Today, but he's in our parish too. Okay. Um, and so Hans and Linda, but the, he grew up in the a, a narrower form of the, um, the Canadian Reformed in Canada, which is a little more narrow than Reformed. So there's a movement today in terms of, which I think Peterson, um, um, Peterson is addressing or pointing to, but someone like Hans and others are, are have explored in much more depth and detail okay. in terms of patristic exegesis. Yep. And its its relevance for people is in terms of the contemplative tradition, the meditative tradition, uh, and ways of approaching the Bible that um, honors the authority of the Bible, but doesn't reduce exegesis to a literal, grammatical, historical. But it yep. doesn't negate it. On the other hand, yeah, it yep. is, it's the it's it it is a step of of many uh, steps in terms of. Um, Often the fathers would compare it to, I don't know if you ever, Christmas here, my wife's German and I come from an English background. So at Christmas, we not only do you have the Christmas story, but the English side would be Dickens Christmas Carol. Oh. The Germans is the nutcracker tradition from Hoffman. And um, yeah, one of the key things in the nutcracker is the nutcracker, um, it, it cracks the nuts. And so the the uh, at the heart of that in approaching the text or any sacred text, there's the there's the layered element, but you've got to break through one level to get to the nut, uh, and so the outer layer or the shell of the literal, grammatical, historical. If you want to get to the mystical, you've got it's like the nutcracker is the exegetical person who cracks the nut to get to or cracks the shell to get to the nut. Or other images often like the rind of an orange. Mm. Okay, so there's the outer, there's the outer layer, then there's the sweetness of the inner exegesis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so this is what, there's quite a movement to which Peterson is pointing to, but people like Hans, and I mentioned Craig Allert earlier, who's looked at the, um, the patristic approach to Genesis, which is not literal, grammatical. Um, and, and, and so there's, there's, it, it, there's sociologically, which we maybe do some, uh, maybe do another thing sometime, is there's fascinating shifts in terms of the sociology of, of faith happening right now from the rise of neo-Calvinism from the Piper, Keller, yeah. Carson, this whole gospel coalition to its alternate, a Catholic, a much more of a Catholic approach and, and what comes in. And Peterson is interestingly enough, he's in the middle of that with, I don't know how astutely or acutely he is aware right. of, of socio, sociologically what's happening, but what he's doing biblically, he's, he's right in the center of it. That, that's, that's what I see. So one of the things, so I came to Sacramento in 97 and I immediately got involved in, I, I pastor the oldest of the, the Christian Reformed churches in Sacramento and I immediately got involved in church planting because we were planting new churches in the late 90s. And when we began, you know, the first church plant in Sacramento was kind of seeker emphasis, a Willow Creek model. The yeah. second church was kind of a cell, a cell model, and they've, they've migrated in a variety of different ways. But the churches we tend to plant now are all this kind of reformed Catholic approach where mm -hmm. Where they're not reading 17th century reformers, they're reading Calvin, and via Calvin they jump more to the patristics because Calvin paid a lot of attention to church fathers. Oh yes, yeah. 
and and so and, and so it's just for and here in California say unlike the Midwest where they continue to plant more seeker emphasis churches which are much much more modernistic here on the coast in California you've got weekly communion you've got you know, remembering your baptism and was well, that holy water or why is that font there and how do we relate to it? So you're exactly right that in terms of, so now I'm the oldest, I'm one of the older of the groups. Most of the church planters, planters are younger. They're dealing with questions of how is the table fenced? What is the language we use around liturgy? And, and actually within our own conversations, we're back to a rather vigorous conversation about sacraments. What yes. is the host? When yes, Jesus yes. says, this is my body, what is it? So now we're, we're I, I'm finding that we're right back into all these reformational struggles. Mm. And now, unlike, say, the 1970s, when there was a strong element of anti-Catholicism still within the Christian Reformed Church, that, in many ways, I think because of the culture war, has receded. Catholics are seen as allies now of evangelicals rather than adversaries. And so right now, in terms of the church, there's a real fascination with Orthodox churches and iconography and how do the arts play in and how do sacraments fit in and all of this. So, yeah. So Peterson comes along and it's like, whoosh. He does. I don't think he knows any of this stuff, but it's like he's germane to all of it in terms of the kinds of issues he's raising. He does. He's a he's a he's a. Um... He's an entry-level thinker for people who are not aware of the bigger issues, but he points to the bigger issues if people go further than him. Yeah. And yeah. in that sense, he's rated, he's, he's a key figure on the stage of the larger sort of aesthetic, liturgical, uh, theological, cultural issues that are swirling about yep. at the present time. And so beyond his issues in terms of postmodernism, neo-Marxism, and these issues which interest some people publicly in terms of what goes on at universities. He's also at the thick of some very important Christian cross currents yep. that are at work. And over the next five to 10 years, it's going to be very interesting. That drama. Is yep. No, that's very true. Well, thank, thank you again, Ron. And okay. I... I will post this this afternoon so you can find it and share it with whomever you like. But I thought this has been, this has been a tremendously helpful conversation and, and we'll, we'll have to do this again. And maybe next time I, I could bring in, I could bring in one of my church planters and I think we could have a very interesting conversation about a number of these other issues, which in the church right now are very, are very hot. But again, I don't think Peterson knows because he doesn't go to church. He doesn't know. He doesn't know how he's monkeying with people's lives. <laughs> no, there's a whole there's a whole world that is take that is unfolding that he would be unaware of, particularly for people who are translating the yeah. individual into the communal. But what's the communal look like liturgically, sacramentally? Yeah. All of these significant questions of soul formation or virtue ethics. Yep. Yeah. And so, yes, and, and so that's where we could do something in sociology of religion yep. and all the, um, the landscape presently. That's uh, how it's uh, the actors and actresses on that uh, yep. landscape yep. and what it may look like and how do we train people in the future to actually be prepared for what's coming their way. Because yep. if they're not prepared bilingually, then they become irrelevant. And when people become irrelevant, they react, they slip into ghettos, they retreat from the public fray. And then that just is, the, that's the death of, of, of Christianity when people yeah. um, just retreat from hard questions. Whereas Peterson, Schaefer, um, any great thinker doesn't do that. Yeah. Uh, and that's what makes them um, fascinating, relevant. And uh, in that sense, to set Peterson in terms of this larger play that's being worked out uh you know on the stage of of um, intellectual university public life it's very significant and do send me yeah do send your interview and i'll i'll, I'll get it posted on clarion right away because oh, we good. get we get we get uh we get hundreds of hits a day on clarion so wonderful uh, i know people would love i know they enjoyed the last one we we did so i'm sure they'll doubly enjoy this one good wonderful well thank you ron and uh we'll be in touch 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.